Hey guys, we have some exciting news. We have been invited to sit on Podcast Row at CrimeCon 2020. CrimeCon is an immersive weekend-long event dedicated to all things true crime that runs May 1st through 3rd in Orlando, Florida. There are guest speakers including Jose Baez and Dr. Michael Baden, podcasts, panels, presentations, and us. Head to SinisterHood.com forward slash links to sign up and use Sinister 2020 for 10% off your standard badge. We hope you join us in Orlando. Two perfect twin daughters, born to excited and happy parents. But as they grew, their behavior was cause for concern. What started as shy silence and a fun secret language between sisters embroiled the pair in a tumultuous relationship that made them the subject of curious journalists and the target of criminal charges. This week's episode is The Silent Twins. Up uh, in the night, your heart fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless, you're doomed You'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood I'm gonna kill you I always thought it'd be super cool to be a twin I was always jealous of the girls in school I only ever knew female twins But I was always jealous of the pairs of twins I knew I went to school from K through 12th mm -hmm. with a set of girl triplets. Oh, cool. And a set of boy twins. Nice. I don't, I've known, I didn't go to school with girl twins, but I've known, I have several friends that have twin children. But when I was little, I thought the triplets and the twins looked identical. And then the older they got, or the older we all got, I was like, they all, they look alike, but you could so clearly identify the two of them. You can like tell, you know, there's certain, and I think it's just attributes that, you know, grow in different ways, I'm sure, depending on nature as well as, you know, environmental factors. Even the the girls, well, they all three had wildly different personalities, but they looked different too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you could definitely tell they were related and, and sisters and so I guess they weren't identical. I don't know if they were identical. I knew one set that was identical and one that was fraternal, but the fraternal ones looked almost identical. That's what I'm wondering. I don't know if they were identical or fraternal and just looked really similar. Mm -hmm. The boys, I'm pretty sure, were identical. Mm -hmm. They looked very, very much alike, but also very, very different personalities. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, and we, actually, I take that back. There was a set of boy twins in grade school who were monsters and would terrorize mm. other children, bullying and just chasing. You never knew who was bullying and you. It, you never knew which one it was. Dang. That's right. Josh and Evan. They're but not, it was both of them. It wasn't were, just one. There wasn't, that was real fast. Oh no, it wasn't one bad twin. It was two horrible twins. <laughs> That's the worst. Because you think, oh man, it's just the bad one, and the other one walks up and you go, oh, it must be the good one here, my savior, and he starts punching you too. Wow. Yeah. And as a parent, you're like, well, we knew one was going to be evil <laughs> statistically, just statistically, but two evil twins. What did we do to deserve this? Yeah. It's a weird trope, though, that twins are evil like one is evil yeah or even that like any twins it's like a weird thing like i mean the shining true that was very twins but, have been besmirched in our pop yeah, culture it's, they never have weirded me out no these ones i just ran from after school so they wouldn't beat me with their backpacks that's what they would do they would take their backpacks off and sling them as full a, of books they would weaponize books and yeah. uh, satchels that's a uh, military tactics at a very early age <laughs> they would some they would, soaps and some socks and beating the shit out of people funny you say that because they would hide in the bushes and wait for you to come by and they would ambush you i think they were training <laughs> yeah, they're training. <laughs> they were training to serve and protect i'm gonna look them up after this and find out what happened to them i bet we know <laughs> so i bet it's not for, too far from I'm what gonna, they were doing back then to check my bushes when i go to leave <laughs> they're just out there with the book bag maybe well i'm christy i'm heather and this is a pretty interesting story i thought it was very fascinating we I, I really had loved some it. patreons patrons? patrons 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 are patrons of our patreon i think so so they are called patrons ask us to do this story because they said it's not why it's not represented a lot in a bunch of podcasts so we started reading it and we're like oh that is really interesting and kind of creepy yeah and just uh heartbreaking but also yeah. you know this 
kind of rebirth that this twins have. And it's, yeah, it's an interesting story start to finish, I think. Lots of twists and turns. When we kind of initially get a topic suggestion inside baseball, that I mean, I'll look like if somebody DMs us on Instagram and says, have you ever heard of the blah, blah, blah case? I'll quickly just Google it. And sometimes I have because I don't want to say no and uh, and if I kind of, you know, I can kind of scroll through and go, eh, but if I'm like, okay, I'm the rest of my day is going to be reading mm-hmm. and I immediately skim this Wikipedia and I start, I was reading the New Yorker and I was watching documentaries and I was trying to find these books. And so that's when you know, okay, this is something to cover because I couldn't stop reading about it. Also, the blah, blah, blah case is really good. That's, you know what? We got to get on next it. week's topic. <laughs> that's right. Spoiler. It's next week. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. Did we just say that? I think we did. God, I never can remember. That's fine. Just always introducing myself. Sometimes people say we sound alike, so it's never hurt. It never hurts to say a name. Well, there you go. Well, uh, you now know who we are. In theory. So, Do we even know who we are? That's true. Does anyone know who anyone is? No, really? So. No. These two, did they? That's a good question. Mm. Some of their poetry and writing. Nice segue. Well, let's get into it. June Allison and Jennifer Lorraine Gibbons were identical twin girls, born April 11, 1963, at a military hospital in Aden, Yemen. June was born first at 8.10 a.m., with Jennifer following her just 10 minutes later. The doctors and parents noticed that Jennifer seemed to be stronger, according to The New Yorker. Their parents, Aubrey and Gloria Gibbons, described the girls as good-natured, but they were slow to speak not uttering their first simple sentences until over the age of three. I believe they described uh, June as like a hearty baby or as like a, a good, hearty baby, a good baby. But that Jennifer was like the stronger, bigger one that came out second. And I think her personality. She had 10 more minutes. She did. Beef she, up in there. She goofed. She g- cooked up. <laughs> ten, ten. Sometimes 10 minutes can make all the difference. I burn things constantly in my toaster. Oven. There you go. 10 have, minutes. You don't have to tell me. It's, it's a fine line. Aubrey, their father, worked as an assistant air traffic controller at the Royal Air Force Base, where the family lived. In an RAF house on a bleak and flowerless, treeless estate. And where the twins spent most of their childhood. The Gibbons had migrated to the UK as part of the Windrush generation. After the Second World War, Europe and the United States both saw great influxes of people immigrating from the Caribbean islands. The British Nationality Act of 1948 gave citizenship of the UK and colonies, meaning anyone from a British colony in the Caribbean could move to the UK and be granted full citizenship. Yeah, the RAF house that they lived in, the it was sort of like row house. They would call them tenements. They would call them almost like projects. So they just they, look like bread box houses yeah, right and, next to and each you other. Get, if you're a, you know, a, a military man, you and your family just get one of these houses, but mm-hmm. it's not like the lap of luxury. No, and they're very cookie cutter and everyone uniform as the mm-hmm. military does. The Gibbons weren't wealthy, but they ensured their children had plenty of high quality reading materials to keep the two entertained. When Aubrey opened his home to a journalist many years after the girls had grown, she discovered an impressive collection of classic literature. The twins were partial to fiction, including Wuthering Heights and Jane Austen, but they also owned encyclopedias and books on the supernatural. The twins each received diaries as Christmas gifts in 1979. These blank pages ignited their passion for writing and storytelling. They soon sent off for a mail-order course in creative writing, and would write elaborate and imaginative stories and poems. It was estimated that the girls would each write 2,000 to 3,000 words per day in a tiny script that was nearly impossible to read. It would be those manuscripts that would gain Marjorie Wallace, a journalist who later studied the twins, an entry into the twins' lives that almost no one else was granted. Did you ever have a diary growing up? I had many diaries. Was the one with the little lock and key? They did. Man. My mom still managed to get into them, though. I'm sure. (laughs) I never had a diary because I would read my sister's diary, and I knew if you wrote a thing, somebody would have, like, they would Monster. So then I got the computer, and I would type my Backstreet Boys fan fiction slash... What's the difference between a computer and pages? I would hide it. I would hide the files. Okay. Folder and folder and folder and folder, and you type it a name. Did your sister hide the diary and you 100%. would go searching for oh, it? for sure. Every time. Monster. She would, she would have to booby trap her room because I would sneak in her room when she would leave. So she would put socks on the fan blades, flip the, you know, with the fan blade switch flipped down. So when I went to flip the light up, it would throw the socks off. And That's she knew, smart. She was very smart. 
So, I mean, she she knew what she was doing. She had a little rascal like me digging around. What did you find in her diary that was so interesting? It was Boy ne- stuff? Yeah. It was never anything, like, super juicy. Did she ever trick you, like, today's the day I kill Heather, finally? <laughs> you know what? She may have. She should have. <laughs> I would also find, like, notes between her and boys. That would be the oh, number yeah. one thing. Or hide in a room when she would bring a boy over, which is so weird. <laughs> That's not, um, not others. No. Or I would answer the phone and our voice sound, our voice is still to this day and our laugh is very similar. I mean, we have almost the same voice and I would like one time just talk to her boyfriend on the phone and it was like, I don't think this is working out. Did you break up with him? I tried to. And he was like, I don't think this is Shannon. (laughs) He got wise. I had many diaries. I had some fun ones that were, you know, it would have prompts and ask you questions and stuff that you would fill in i believe there's a box in my mom's attic that still has them Mm -hmm. and several years ago i was up there looking for something and i found some and i just started reading them and i just laugh out loud so good so cringy so it's just so first of all my handwriting was i mean the handwriting of a a 10 year old is hilarious in itself but just the things you think are so important and dramatic oh yeah it's your whole world then. Oh yes. And now to look back and be like, if only you want to just those whisper. were my worries. Now <laughs> exactly. I want to. They have that show, uh, Mortified. Oh yeah. That they the tours and it's been at DCH several times, where the whole premise of the show is to bring old poems or diaries or something you've written that is just so cringeworthy that you're mortified by and you get on stage and read it and perform it for people and it's always just hilarious in my my uh box in the other room i have a notebook that i wrote my high school poetry in and i went i found it recently and i was reading it and it's like the cigarette smoke i never have <laughs> you smoked sm- a cigarette in one time in my life but your dad well Were i you know talking about the smoke no, in your house no i was talking about like i put the cigarette in my mouth and my lipstick stains <laughs> it, and the coffee cup i did not drink coffee i did not smoke cigarettes i just was like these are you things. were like june writing about stuff you didn't know about 100 <laughs> percent. yes i know I, I relate highly i highly relate to her i might find those diaries and as patreon content reads some of those entries oh i can go i I have my poetry i'll read my (laughs) high school poetry for you it's so cringy it's so embarrassing it's it's hard to read because you're just it you're (laughs) you it evokes such feelings it makes you want to vomit dread (laughs) it's like can you imagine how insufferable you must have been no i'm talking about you as the general you not you you but just yeah but also mimi (laughs) (laughs) anybody at that age is insufferable well, moving around between RAF stations shook the girls' foundation and left them with one constant in their lives, each other. The girls would rarely speak, earning them the nickname the Silent Twins, but they loved to read. According to an unaired interview with the BBC published in The New Yorker, Aubrey said when his daughters first started their schooling, We knew they had the speech problem. In the house, they talk, make sounds and all that. But we knew they weren't quite like, you know, normal children talking readily. June said in an interview in the documentary, Silent Twin Without My Shadow, that she believed her mom was worried about her and her sister. Gloria confirmed this, saying, Well, they spoke, but we couldn't understand what they were saying, and that's troubling then. When they knew we couldn't understand them, then they went back in the shell. Aubrey noticed their nonverbal communication as well, especially how the twins had signs with each other. If you asked one a question, say June, she'd have to look at Jenny before she answered. We thought it was all part and parcel of being twins. Hmm. So it's like, where's the line between? Yeah. No, that's fun. Like, if you wrote about how I behaved as a child, it would be troubling of the things I did. I spoke in a British accent. I kicked a hole in the ki- the garage wall trying to run up it and do a backflip like Donald O'Connor and singing it in the rain. That's just kids. I watched Grease. Kids do the dumbest shit I I've ever Grease, seen. I watched Grease like twice a day every day for a month until my parents had to forcibly take the DVD. The- that was me with Troop Beverly Hills. Oh god, it's such a good movie. So good. Oh god. Kids are dumb as hell. And I broke my arm falling off a Lego bucket. Oh, like, right. it's, I mean, 
at, even at two years old, Ella does stuff, and I'm just like, what are you doing? Well, that wasn't smart. I <sighs> saved my gum, my chewed gum, on the wall right by the light switch, which is kind of a mean trick, because when you go to turn the light, you accidentally touch it all the time. But there were probably 30 pieces of chewed oh, gum. Oh, that's just gross. Yeah. I saved all my teeth in a little box. Uh, my mom did that. Tie into the mini sewed. Oh, yeah. Our mini sewed. Um, so my yeah. mom saved. In fact, she still has my teeth, my old teeth. I guarantee our teeth are at my mom's house. I saved, I saved Petal's teeth when they fall out. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> and I will say, make them into a necklace. I'll save, yeah, Ella's teeth as well. Would you rechew the gum? No, you just stuck it on the wall. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you right now. Did your mom be like, Heather, knock that shit off? She was like, Well, it's your room. Oh, I would be like, that attracts ants. Go get that shit off the True, wall. It may, it may have. Did you have an ant problem in your room? <laughs> you know, no, no, I did not. <laughs> What was the, what were your, what was your thinking? I was a very strange child in that I had to keep things. It made me really upset to get rid of stuff and throw like stuff away. a hoarder? Away. Uh, to an extent. Like it would, it was very hard for me to get rid of toys. It was hard for me to even stuff, something, something as simple as like gum, books. I wouldn't use color books because I didn't want to like use them up and lose them. It was, I don't know what that was of this. Like, I don't Do know. Do you still have that? I've, I really uh, consciously work on not doing that. I it was, improv actually has helped me of being like spend it the good idea the you know, first idea best idea just yeah color the color book you're not going to ruin it there will be others and like realizing the universe is abundant but when you're like eight you're like my toys I had a problem getting rid of toys mm-hmm. even now I have a problem getting rid of things that I've had for a long time or if somebody gives me something mm-hmm. and I'm like I don't really like this gift, but such and such gave it to me and therefore I can't get rid of it because every time I look at this gift, I'll remember that person. Or you feel bad like it's an indictment on them that you don't want to keep it. Absolutely. Or I I don't like getting rid of stuffed animals and stuff because... I feel like they have feelings. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yes. I was like, if when I would like leave my stuffed animals to go to school, I was like, I'm so sorry, you guys. I I have always felt like toy story-ish about my yes. toys i don't legit think they come to life and like do shit but i souls. i feel like they have like little stuffed souls in their bodies or something and i i don't know like i've gone to i'll be at like the grocery store after valentine's and they'll be like one teddy bear left on the You're aisle so and i'm like sad. you're coming home with me buddy <laughs> no way i can't leave you I yeah. thinking, well, i guess no one wants me yeah and that's why i've got to take it home uh, so i get that i get that part for sure and not wanting to get rid of i mean you're talking to the person who has literally kept every card anyone has ever given me oh really since i was and note or letter anyone's ever written me that's so nice i have just boxes of letters from like going off to camp when i was in elementary school or cards from my parents when i was you know a a kid and everything i have kept a lot of my parents would mail me cards in chicago so i have all those yeah i i don't like to throw anything like that away i feel you i feel you The Gibbons had three other children besides the twins, two older children, Greta and David, and one younger sister, Rosie. Greta and David were kept out of June and Jennifer's private world, but they allowed sweet Rosie into their world of writing, code speaking, and make-believe, even recording spoken stories and plays for her to listen to and enjoy. In the many schools the girls attended, they were taunted because of their strange behavior, freezing in place whenever someone would look at them or refusing to speak. However, they were mostly bullied and ridiculed at school, as they were the only black children in their community. June told New Yorker journalist Hilton Owls that at... Eight or nine, we started suffering, and we stopped talking. People called us names. We were the only black girls in school. Terrible names. They pulled our hair. We said we weren't going to speak to anybody. We stopped talking altogether. Only us two, in our bedroom, upstairs. So here's where things start getting really sad. Heartbreaking. Because clearly they're being bullied and just retreating into themselves Mm -hmm. because that's easier than giving anyone any kind of ammunition to use against them and they she says in that interview that um not without my shadow she just goes on and uh, elaborates that they would get stared at looked at and even the school nurse guy said i had a row of white arms and then there were two black arms and he said i had 
as a practitioner in that area of Wales, I had never even seen people from, you know, because this, the Windrush, you know, migration, you know, from everybody moving there, it was a new, you know, they're having, everybody's having to learn to live together. And some people were not learning well. And it's kind of paralleling the U.S. in the 1960s where just ostracizing and, and these poor girls were repeatedly, not only their, you know, kind of almost fun twin-like behavior, but then they're mostly just being mercilessly bullied. Yeah. And she said they wouldn't even, it got to where they wouldn't even look other people in the eyes because they didn't even want to, they wanted to be invisible mm-hmm. essentially. And, and so not they just, open that. yeah, they just stopped talking. They stopped communicating. They stopped looking at people just to be completely invisible. There's video on that documentary as well of them walking from like a car inside. Their heads are down. Their arms are just down to their sides and they do walk in sync together. But like you said, just completely facing the ground, like face totally down. Yeah. It's they so don't want to be noticed. Mm -mm. The family moved once again when the twins were 11 years old. At the Haverford West County Secondary School, June, Jennifer, and their brother David found that they were once again the only black students. Sadly, all three children suffered massive amounts of bullying. The torment became so bad, the teachers created a special protocol for the Gibbons children, let them out five minutes early each day so they could get a head start on the walk home and hopefully beat the rush of bullies waiting to taunt them. That's unreal that that's the response. I mean, I guess the teachers are trying. They're trying. I think it would be better to talk to all the children about not bullying them. Let's not make them lose five minutes a day every day, which has a cumulative negative effect. And yeah, it it implies that it's their fault, that it's their responsibility to get home before this starts happening. And they're losing out on their education when the other kids get a full day. And the other kids are also not being punished they're just giving mm-hmm. giving them a head start to get away from it. They're like, we're not going to stop you. We're just going to prevent you. Like, you literally can't because they won't be here for you to bully. While the girls' behavior was seemingly abnormal, no teachers apparently noticed. June and Jennifer were thoughtful and well-behaved, according to the documentary Silent Twin Without My Shadow. When all the students in their school received vaccines, the school medical officer, Dr. John Rees, who was administering the shots, noticed that neither girl recoiled at the sight of the needle. They simply stood there and accepted their vaccine. Dr. Rees was confused, as most children their age would be tearing about. But the Gibbons girls walked calmly with one another, expressionless, with heads bowed, almost as if they were in a trance. Hilton Owls, writing for The New Yorker, implied that the girls flew under the radar largely because of their race. Although the girls behaved abnormally, he said, teachers paid them no mind as they weren't conventionally problematic, which, as the only black children in school, would have most certainly drawn attention. It seemed as long as they stayed quiet, the teachers simply brushed them off. This is definitely a case, I think, where they were overlooked, their elective mutism and their uh, abnormal behavior was fully overlooked because of their race. Oh, for sure. Like, well, they're being quiet, at least. We'll just let them be quiet. Elective mutism... They also had some mental health exactly. still going, for sure. It's caused by an underlying Yes, condition. and if these were well-to-do white children, like that. doctors would have been involved. Little a lot. Bradford's not speaking. Yes. You know, in this case, they're like, eh, they're just probably shy. It's fine. It's, but this, to this guy's credit, he was like, this is abnormal behavior. I'm going to get them a referral. Yeah. He actually noticed as a medical professional. But it's it's sad and interesting that their race both drew attention to them and also caused them to not receive attention. Yeah. Not it attention drew all the negative attention and bullying, but when they needed medical intervention and help from teachers and someone to just care, then it was, they weren't noticed. They're brushing under the rug. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Rees provided the twins a referral to a speech therapist at a nearby hospital. A child psychologist assessed them and declared that June and Jennifer were elective mutes. The twins still refused to speak, although they did agree to read aloud on tape for the therapist, so long as no one else was in the room. This therapist was one of the first medical professionals who noticed the power dynamic between June and Jennifer. Although they seemed not to move at all, doctors would notice a twitch in Jennifer's eye, signaling June to remain still and silent. Years later, journalist and expert on the twins, Marjorie Wallace, told the Herald Scotland newspaper that although the two seemed to move in unison, 
In her opinion, it was Jennifer who was ultimately controlling June. And that will be a pattern that we will see repeated. And it sounds like the dad kind of noticed because he kind of also said, oh, you know, for instance, if June wanted to answer, she would look and look to Jennifer. Yeah. That happened to be the example that he used. And the therapist said in meeting with them, she got the impression June wanted to talk to her. Mm-hmm. And then Jennifer would cut her a look and just shut her down. Mm-hmm. And June said they called it eye language oh and that's how they they're kind of like yeah they would just look at each other and and she would just give her this look like when you were acting up in the grocery store and your mom couldn't yell so she just cut you that look you're like i better shut my mouth right now my mom would also pinch our elbows Mm, yeah the elbow pinch a little quick stop it yeah, that's a good place to pinch, though, because you can't hurt anybody on your no, elbow. No, not really. No, there's nothing there. I'm pinching my elbow right well, she now. She would do like you this. You can't feel you it. You mash your thumb into the the tendon. Oh, well, that does hurt. It's very painful. Yes. <laughs> Nancy. It doesn't har- cause any harm. It sure shuts you up, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, outside school, June and Jennifer began playing games with one another. The Herald Scotland newspaper spoke with Marjorie Wallace, who reported that the two began to create rituals. Where they decided between them which one would wake up in the morning first, which would breathe first, and the other wasn't allowed to breathe until the first one breathed, like some sinister childhood game that had gone out of control. The girls were 14 in 1977, when they were first sent to the Eastgate Center for Special Education, where they were psychologically tested. The results, according to People magazine, showed that the two were socially maladjusted, depressed and withdrawn on the one hand, and well-balanced and independent on the other. To many outsiders and observers, the two almost never spoke. However, hidden cameras within the facility caught something strange. When June and Jennifer sat alone in a room, believing that they were by themselves and in complete privacy, something incredible happened. Rather than sit catatonic or mumble in their private language, They behaved much as two 14-year-old girls would be expected to interact, laughing, talking, and joking with one another. However, when faced with a therapist, neither twin would speak a word. According to journalist Eliza Smith of NPR, the twins chirped and squeaked, enunciating the wrong syllables. One specialist in elective mutism, who listened to slow down audio of the twins speaking, estimated that it was Barbadian slang mixed with English, spoken incredibly fast. So So they developed this language between the two of them. They wouldn't really speak at home. They didn't. If at the beginning they would speak to their parents and and their siblings some. When the bullying started escalating at school, they pretty much just shut everybody out except Mm -hmm. each other. And their parents said they would hear them up in their room talking in this language that was just as confusing to them as their silence was. Well, and that's the June said in that documentary. Oh, when we would say stuff to our parents, they would say, what did you just say? And we would repeat it and they would say, what did you just say? So it sounds like they may have had some type of speech impediment early on that wasn't treated mixed with using maybe English young, like, you know, cool slang that they learned at school versus Barbadian slang. So, you know, they didn't quite fit in at school because then the school classmates didn't understand them. They didn't quite fit in at home. And she said we would get so frustrated that they would say, what did you just say? What did you just say? And she said, we just stopped talking. We just stopped trying. They were they they could only understand each other. Mm-hmm. They just became so entwined and engrossed with each mm-hmm. other, and we'll see this pattern of they couldn't live with each other. They couldn't live without. They just became it became too enmeshed. Yeah, and I wonder too if it it had just been one of them and not twins. If they weren't able, the parents weren't able to understand them, then the child would get maybe the speech therapy that they needed and then you would have been able to you know would have eventually been able to develop i was thinking that too or wondering that or if it was just one of them being bullied though what that would have looked like Mm -hmm. if they hadn't had someone else to lean on that knew what they were going through Mm -hmm. in that case it's nice that they had each other absolutely because otherwise you would really just be totally by yourself Mm -hmm. and alone well at home was a different story According to the New Yorker, the twin silence was a powerful force in the Gibbons house. Family dinners were nearly completely silent. Their older sister, Greta, reportedly wept at the miserable situation. Yeah, they said they would all be sitting around the family dinner table and the parents would ask the twins a question and they just stared at them. And the the older sister would just get so mad and be like, what's wrong with you? Just say something. It's got to be they you've got three other siblings. I'm sure they're also in the twin shadow mm-hmm. because all of the parents' energy and focus is going towards these two that clearly have something wrong. They can't understand them. They don't know how to communicate. So the other ones are kind of just 
left to to do their own thing mm-hmm. that's got to be it's super frustrating it's, and it's that you see that happen a lot of times in families where the one sibling has an illness or something that yeah. the other sibling you know without proper you know family dynamics kind of either training or therapy or something that you can kind of feel like feel like you've been left in the dust which yeah. then again you feel bad because you're like well at least i'm not the one with the illness but you know it's a natural feeling of like i'm here too mom and dad yeah for sure With things not improving at school either, two teachers decided the best course of action would be to separate the girls. The plan was for one to remain in the Eastgate Center and for one to be sent away to another school with a specialized teacher. However, when it came time for the schoolmasters to inform June and Jennifer, all hell broke loose. Rather than arguing with the teachers who had concocted the plan, the twins turned on one another. They engaged in a violent outburst, physically attacking one another, pulling hair, scratching faces, until the teachers managed to pull them apart and carry out the separation. It seemed like um, a strange reaction. It does seem like I, I've been trying to wrap my head around why they would react like that. They literally said that I I can't, of course, you know, it's not that I was there, but it's hard. I can't remember if it said June or Jennifer, but one of them literally stuck her nails in the other one's face and dug her cheek skin. And, of course, pulling their hair. T- they were like tumbling. I think it might just stem from... That whole, I love you, but I hate you. Mm -hmm. Like they, they wouldn't be having to go through this. If the other one didn't exist. Yes. And, and if they could just exist independently of one another, Mm -hmm. but they've created this world that's so dark and twisted for themselves that they can't get out of it now. So it seems like they're trying to fight to get out maybe. And the anger that they must feel towards each other, but also just everyone, teachers, Mm -hmm. the kids at school, their parents. And there's a lot of pent up untreated emotions going on in them that is bound to come out one way or the other. Well, it is hard because they clearly do need some type of therapy. And when they're offered the opportunity you know, whether June was interested in talking or, you know, but they're offered the opportunity and clearly together they're not taking it, you know. Right. So it seems at first when I read that, I thought that's, you know, that's monstrous to separate them. But it seems like all the other efforts weren't working. You hurt the ones you love the most, too. It looks like, too. Well, the threat of separation seemed to do the trick. Suddenly, the one silent girls were chatty with everyone, their teachers, employees of Eastgate, anyone who would listen so long as they could remain together. But, sadly, their efforts to appease were in vain, and in spring of 1978, the twins' worst nightmare came true. June and Jennifer, who had remained inseparable since birth, were separated. June was moved to St. David's adolescent unit, but things did not go well. She was nearly catatonic, refusing to move or speak or get out of bed. Jennifer's reaction was much the same. They remained separated for several months until doctors and teachers realized they wouldn't be functional unless they were together. I think, too, they said she almost would do like stiff as a board. The, yeah, they said she would, they would walk weight. in the room and she would just be lying completely motionless like she was dead on, mm-hmm. on her bed. It's It's a strange power that they have over one another. And I also think June was wanting to pull away and be more independent. And Jennifer had that control over her. And so it was just this like always this push and pull between them of I can't be with you, but I can't be without you. When almost too, when you're used to having someone control whether you can speak, whether you can breathe, whether you can eat, that when you're apart, you would probably fall into kind of a desolate. You know, you're very yeah. isolated. You, feel you don't like, know what to do with yourself. Mm-hmm. The two were reunited and were let out when they were almost 17. They were unable to obtain jobs, so instead filed for unemployment benefits and remained living with their parents, where their mother, Gloria, would provide them with meals and household services. However, the girls rarely emerged from their room upstairs. They said that because they wouldn't come out, that Gloria would have to bring them their tray of food. They'll just and leave because they wouldn't open the door when she was there. And then it was almost like, uh, you know, you see in the old movies with like the king that you put the tray mm-hmm. out and then they'll open it when they want. And then later on, the the like room service, the dirty tray, they would put it out and she would have to go up and get it. And half the time they wouldn't eat and it would just rot mm-hmm. and mold because that was another thing that they withheld food and had these weird rituals and games about eating and everything. And they they would talk to their sister, Rosie, but they would. If they had to communicate with their parents, they would only write notes Mm -hmm. like 
we want to watch Top of the Pops tonight. Leave the living room door open. Yeah. And just slide that to their parents. So that was imagine how frustrating for the parents too. And and Aubrey and Gloria said we didn't really know any better. I mean, we you don't know how to handle we that. We thought that these medical professionals, we we were never really told like they're getting better or worse or we need to send them here or do this. We would just learn, well, we're sending them here now and we thought they knew best, so we mm-hmm. we let them do it. But they said looking back, they feel a ton of remorse and guilt and wish they had stepped in and everything. But again, they're one of the few black families in this community mm-hmm. with all of these white doctors telling them no this is what we should do and just making these decisions and they feel powerless i think so and also the case itself is so rare it's not like they said oh your child has x disease here's how we treat it here's what we're going to do in the best course of action they said we have two twins we can't understand them we're going to call it generally elective mutism although they do speak yeah they know how to speak they're mm-hmm. capable of speaking they're it's just choosing not to such a rare case that you don't the the, the doctors that they were seeing didn't know how to deal with it yeah. as anybody else june and jennifer continued to struggle longing for individuality while simultaneously feeling bound to one another jennifer who had always been the more dominant one struggled with her sister wanting to pull away According to the New Yorker, when Jennifer felt the distance growing, she would often say to June, You are Jennifer. You are me. To which June would desperately reply, I am June. I'm June. In a later interview, June said, And we used to say to each other, Give me back myself. If you give me back myself, I'll give you back yourself. That's wild. It's like almost there's like no autonomy over your own soul or your own existence, your being of who you are. But did they create that for themselves? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's like a strange, almost like codependency of like, I can't live without you. You're my, my whole world's wrapped up in another person. And I think it stemmed from the bullying and not being understood and not feeling like they had a place of their own because they were moving around all the time from place to place and it were never really settled or had a strong foundation. So isolated. And yes. Then all they had was each other. If you're isolated, at least you have another person. But then it's kind of like you're stranded on a desert island with somebody you love. After a while, they start to get real annoying. <laughs> yeah. You know? And if you do have a speech impediment that, and, but you both have it, mm-hmm. or maybe one had it and the other one picked it up because you're around each other so much. And you're the only ones that can understand each other. Yeah, they just ha- they blocked everyone out. And it was just their two-person world. Mm-hmm. By this time, June and Jennifer had amassed a large amount of writing. Using their unemployment benefit, paying 980 pounds in installments of 80 pounds a month, June Vanity published her first novel, Pepsi Cola Addict, in 1982. In her novel, June wrote about a young student who was dumped by his pretty cheerleader girlfriend due to his addiction to Pepsi. While in school, he engages in an inappropriate sexual relationship with his math teacher. He is moved from that school only to face sexual advances from a security guard at his new school. According to author Kelsey Osgood, who has gotten her hands on the rare book, only five libraries in the world have copies. The book is not completely nonsensical, but not elegant or meticulous either. June attempts to describe Malibu, California, a place she'd never been, and write dialogue for Americans, whom she'd never encountered. Not content to be outdone by her sister, Jennifer then took the time to write three novels herself, although none of them saw publication. That article I read about this book was very fascinating because it totally goes into, like, details from the book. There's excerpts from the book. It's a it's a wild book. And they said he drank 300 Pepsis a day. Yeah, you yeah. You just have to go, no, he didn't. And the relationship he gets into with the security guard is this like confusing homosexual relationship and it seemed like she was writing about everything you would read in a judy bloom book Mm -hmm. or anything you know a teenage girl just normal things you'd be curious about and were wondering about but it was all getting thrown into into one story in malibu where in malibu she she described something like tenement housing in malibu and the author kelsey osgood said that would be like saying it was a spanish villa in the middle of new jersey where you're like no (laughs) no there's not really a lot of tenements in malibu california it's normally this type of house or whatever yeah so but it was all she knew but then she had these fairy tale like settings of malibu magical yes. magical malibu wasn't it the what oh that book uh the blonde twins what you know they it was like the whole series the hardy boys 
No, it was twins. They were, um, oh, Sweet Valley High. That's the one. Weren't they twins? I don't know. Maybe. They were both blonde headed, though. I think they might have been twins. I could be wrong. Either way, though, I wonder if they had read stuff like that. And, you know, that was became kind of their fantasy world. Like fixated and stuff. on that. Did you read that kind of stuff? No, I uh, I read real weird stuff. I Were read you like Tommy and you just went straight Stephen King at eight years old. Um, when I was in seventh grade, I read American Psycho for a book project. And my seventh grade now and eighth grade teacher, who I'm still friends with was like, I said, what, why did you let me do that? She's like, I'm never going to tell a kid not to read a book. <laughs> but I did have to ask your mom, is it OK? Do you understand the content of this book? And mom was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She did not understand the content of that book. The book is fucked up i've never read it it's way worse than the movie first of all i tried to go back and reread it like maybe like a year ago it's not good writing fun fact (laughs) well it's seven in seventh grade you're just like i can't believe i'm getting away with this oh man i mean it's like there's a whole thing with the mouse it's up a butt up a a vagina hole oh up a vag yeah worse than a butt Uh, arguably yes i think i think so uh so yeah so stuff i read a lot of weird i read did you also read like age appropriate stuff like that not uh i read both i think i read like um oh i'm trying to maybe like a nancy drew ish book but i got really mm-hmm. into um kind of whimsical fictiony nonfiction. there's a guy named mark lerner l-e-y-n-e-r and he wrote a book called tooth and prince on a corn dog and after i found him i got way into david sedaris like very obsessively into david sedaris but that was more high school right uh that was middle school too was he? I guess yeah. He yeah. Was still on. It was his first book. Sometimes uh, I forget you're younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I um. I roll with the cool older kids. <laughs> I I read both. I read. I loved Judy Bloom. I mean, but that was like fifth grade. Did you ever read Are You There, God? It's Me, oh, Margaret. Of course. I did read that book. Yes. Because everyone was like, "There's periods." Oh in yeah. This book. And that's why you would read them because mm-hmm. it was talking about these taboo subjects that you were very curious about this was also when i had my subscription to sassy magazine right. <laughs> so it was all that stuff that you wanted to know about but you were too embarrassed to ask about mm-hmm. so you just looked to judy bloom for all the she, answers you know what? she came through but she i through. i also liked sweet valley high the, the i think it was that one the twins and um i never read like babysitter's club i never read that um, I don't remember I loved Goosebumps. Babysitter's Club. I did. That's the age appropriate. My brothers loved Goosebumps. Huge in the Goosebumps. I was, I was a little older for Goosebumps. I probably had 30 Goosebumps books. Yeah. My brother, Zach, uh, he probably still has the entire collection. I think my mom might still have my... Yeah. Oh, I need to get those. Those would be good. Those are still fun. There's still some creepy ones. Oh, I did love Sideways Stories from Wayside School. Those were great. Obsessed yeah. with those. And, those uh, you good. know, Shel Silverstein, I like that. So it's all age appropriate. Those are age appropriate. Yeah. 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 But then I would throw in, like books on the Bermuda Triangle or um, why is she reading about the Kennedy assassination yeah I was obsessed with Rescue 911 and Unsolved Mysteries so I had I had both I mean honestly it's how I am now exactly love us weekly also love to read about serial killers so not much has changed (laughs) nope (laughs) just the authors in some ways the twins were social and behaved like teens are expected to behave drinking smoking marijuana and even spending time with boys when Jennifer lost her virginity, she wrote in her journal that the secrets of love, passion and sex are all there in my mind, like a string of golden flashes. A week later, June lost her virginity to the same boy. Aww. This was very interesting to read about. They met these boys when they were in school and they were all American boys. And when they got out of school, they wanted to track and they kind of stood up for them when others were bullying them and stuff and they tracked them down and the boy they knew had gone to school but he had younger brothers who they soon befriended and the youngest of them she's the one she had sex with him in a church while her sister sat there and watched oh my gosh and her sister said it was like i was seeing her for the first time and how she must see me and and then a week later she slept with the same boy did this other sister watch i it did not say Uh, but yeah that's not how i would picture losing my virginity no most when i do because i'm not married so (laughs) that's true you're a a white virgin uh still a virge but uh yeah somebody watching in a church. In a church. Also that. The the boy was 14. Aye. 
So, a lot to unpack there. A lot of choices made. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not yeah. going to pass judgment. They had a rough you time. You know what? Yeah, yeah. But I, I would not partake in any of those activities. But mm. I did get my first kiss in a church lockup. Oh, my gosh, really? Yeah. Shut up. I was in seventh grade. Oh, my God. What was his name? Matt. Was he so cute? <laughs> Still remember that. Oh, my gosh. He was cute. Yeah, he so was cute. cute. He was cute. Although the two seemed to be in sync to the outside world, trouble was brewing in their relationship. They continued heading down a dangerous path. The two took up even more drinking and marijuana and were prone to violent outbursts. Behind the closed door of their upstairs room, fights would break out. One particularly violent night, Jennifer attempted to strangle her sister using the cord from a radio. In another violent incident, June tried drowning her twin in a nearby river. The so things are escalating. Taking a turn. Again, they they have all this stuff inside of them that has nowhere to to go all they're doing is writing three thousand words a day which yeah is a lot of words a day that's so many words a day and speaking very few words a day mm-hmm. but they don't have therapists to talk to or, or their parents to vent to like no one that you would normally have to listen to all of these problems you're going through that they've created a world where that isn't an option for yeah, them for sure In 1981, June and Jennifer had finished with school and were living a life of unemployment, dreaming of fame and fortune as novelists. But with no prospects and nothing but time on their hands, June and Jennifer's behavior began having disastrous consequences. They began by committing vandalism and petty theft, stealing bicycles and going door to door, ringing bells and running off. But the two were not content to simply make trouble out on the street. They began breaking into buildings, including a training center and a school. But even this was not sufficient. June's diary reveals that the two had bigger plans. All this week, I've wanted to burn down the tractor store in Snowdrop Lane. I burned it down today, with the help of Jay, of course. It was the biggest night of my life. We climbed over a barbed wire fence. The sky grew blacker, and it started to rain. All the while, my lovely, glorious fire was licking its way through the roof, and the thick smoke filled the night sky. It was a picture which will live in my mind forever— Oh, what a sinful, evil, selfish mind. I know the Lord will forgive me. It's been a long, painful, hard year. Don't I deserve to express my distress? This is tragic, but Snowdrop Lane sounds like a magical place. Also, I mean, this is sad for the tractor store. I don't, I've never read that anyone was injured. No, I Imagine think it's just how, tractors. Imagine how, if you're full of, like, despair, despondency, and rage, and you just set a big fucking fire. It's got to feel good. I mean, you know, it's not healthy. Don't do that. No, don't do that. But to watch something burn. <laughs> feels good, man. It's it's cleansing. I one mean, time, fire is cleansing. One time, Leanne and I uh, may I have like, I had one of those chimenea, kind of like a, a clay pot, yeah, yeah. you know, and we t- took sheets of paper, we set a fire in it, and we took sheets of paper at the end of the year, and we just burned things that we were leaving behind in the year before. That's great. It was so, it was just very That's a thing. They do healthy. that on Friends, too. And then the firemen can't come, and one of them's really hot, and they get dates out of it. Well, that didn't Did that happen, happen to y'all? No, but it, I wish it did, because that would have been a, you know, a way better story to the end of the you know, end of the story. Otherwise, we were just like, we felt cathar- the cathartic, and I we think gave each other a I think that's a great feeling, too. I think she and I would both agree. Hot firemen come in, though, would be... <laughs> Next level. It was fine as it was. That is a next level situation. (laughs) One evening about a week after the fire, the two were out for a stroll. They decided to throw an object through a window at a local college, shattering the glass and creating a noise that alerted a patrolman to come and investigate. Seemingly caught in the act, the twins are arrested for the vandalism. Later, as officers searched their bedrooms, the twins' diaries were uncovered filled with page after page of confessions to their crimes. You know, this cop's trying to figure out who burned a tractor store down on Snowdrop Lane, and you open up a diary, and it says, man, it felt so good to burn that tractor store down on Snowdrop Lane. First of all, I'm pretty sure that's the plot to a Sweet Valley High book. (laughs) That they find the diary? I I mean, it sounds like it could be. They found it in my diary. Also, what is the lawyer saying? Write it and regret it? it. Say it and forget it. Write it and regret it. (laughs) Don't write stuff down. Don't. Don't write all your confessions down. Don't do that. But if you... Don't talk, and That's, you got to get it out. Write it down. Burn it. Yeah. They should have thrown it all in the tractor store in fire. In the fire, because then there's no evidence. But what? And one thing they mention in the New Yorker article is how fascinating it is of how ballsy they're being. They really don't give a shit if they're caught or not. They really were. I mean, it's we sort of, I won't say we glossed over it, but to list off their crimes, they were 
constantly stealing stuff. Yeah. Constantly busting out windows. For, setting fires all over the city for the fun of it and then breaking into places just to walk around i mean they were it was like they needed an outlet and the drinking and the smoking and then the boys wasn't kind of like enough of an outlet and so it's just this again it's this untreated built up pent up frustration and and the problems that they were dealing with that were unfortunately in this case they're like self-medicating through crime like yeah. they turned to this like outlet they said the the summer where they both lost their virginity and and they were hanging out with those boys they were it was three brothers a lot that it was five weeks of just them feeling happy and free but at the same time these white boys treated them like dogs oh really like literally would like throw scraps of food at them would just call them names sometimes they would be nice it was a very like gaslighty relationship twisted but they would go to the city in short skirts and, and wigs, and they said it would take three hours for them to get dressed because they just wanted to look like Hollywood ladies. Again, this fairy tale life of going and, and hanging out with these guys. And then at the end of the summer, when the boys moved back to the States, they asked if they could have like a talisman of sorts to remember them by. And one of them sold a jacket to to one of them she, he sold it yeah to and the other one gave him like a pair of dirty socks and it was just real shitty things like that but they said it was some of the happiest they've been because they were just free and they but they also said the only way we could talk to them is if we were drinking Wow. And that they felt like God told them to go buy whiskey so they could talk and be free and, and experience what other kids were experiencing and everything. And that's, a, you know, it doesn't sound like they had a physical dependence on alcohol, but at least a psychological one of I can't interact unless I'm drinking. I think is, a lot of people feel that way. I, do, I really Liquid do. Liquid courage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I know a ton of people that have social anxiety that are like, let me get a few drinks in me at a party so I can go talk. Interestingly enough, drinking makes your anxiety way worse. It's true. So it's just adding fuel to the fire. There's an interesting book a friend of mine recommended called This Naked Mind that kind of dispels those myths that you internalize and tell yourself that, oh, I can't, a party's not fun unless I'm drinking. Mm-hmm. And then when you, once you like unravel those myths, you're like, no, this is super fun. It's fine. Yeah. But it's stuff that you've hyped up yourself or like, you know, all the posters you see on, or not posters, but like the things you see at Hobby Lobby that are like, I use wine to cook. Sometimes I even put it in the food, yeah. you know, where it's kind of become this culture to be like, love it. Like I have a glass now that says true crime and wine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, um, ingrained in the culture of that you have to drink and that's how how you enjoy things and how that as soon as you kind of like unravel that it's like not I, no I'm good it's a weird thing I mean I occasionally drink very rarely but Tommy hasn't drank in probably two years mm-hmm. and several of our friends just don't drink at all mm-hmm. and once you kind of decide I don't drink anymore mm-hmm. it makes it much easier to go out and and our good our good and dear friend and comedian Scriven Bernard, who also listens to the show, who also is just amazing. He's one of my favorite humans on the planet. Human. Yes, he said that he would always because he, he I I don't know if he has he had stopped drinking and he said I had to tell myself I just don't drink anymore. Mm-hmm. So then I don't have this battle when I go out of. Am I going to drink? Do I want? And that's how I would feel. I'd be like, mm-hmm. I don't want to drink tonight because mm-hmm. I know it's going to make me feel like shit tomorrow. I'm not going to have as much fun, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, everyone else is. I kind of want to. So if you just say, I don't drink, then it's, you can't. It it, then it's stop. Full stop. You you don't have that argument with yourself anymore. And once he told me that, I was like, that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like them. I practice now. I've been for the last week and it's been going very well mindful eating and very just if I want to if I'm hungry then I will go and have an apple or a kiwi or whatever or eat and not just like okay I'm just gonna like eat all these snacks I'm I, proud of you that you're eating fruit oh thank you I have you know that's rare I like never you said you don't like fruit I know I'm getting into fruit I'm, I'm very into raspberries right now I can't raspberries are good not get enough raspberries and I have been eating a lot of vegetables I I've been trying raspberries. To, oh man raspberries and so I've been trying to be really thoughtful and to that extent I was out at DCH on Friday night and it's like I don't want to drink. Again, mm-hmm. you're like, I just don't want to. Because then you are like, 
well, Taco Bell wouldn't be that bad. Yeah, and you're like, I, well, I'm just also like, I just didn't want it. Like, I don't, yeah. I, like you said, I know how I'll feel afterwards. I will have horrible acid reflux. Yeah. And so I just say, like, I'm okay. I, I'm very addicted to Topo Chico's, though, so. Oh, I love to, I'm Topo Chico, Salil, just club soda with lime mm-hmm. is a big go-to for me. Oh, yeah. I like flavored waters a lot. Gosh, yeah. Big fan. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, well, good for you. Thank Healthy you. choices. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. My New Year's resolution was to eat more vegetables, which was very vague. But wasn't that also Kevin on the offices? Yeah, I think it <laughs> You're was. killing him. <laughs> You're killing. Just shove a broccoli <laughs> in his mouth. Yeah, that's me. That's me, but with fruit. But not anymore. I'm on all about the raspberries. But it sounds like the the twins here were struggling kind of with that psychological dependence, and you know, mm-hmm. I can't interact with he, it's society in general, but I can't interact with these boys I like. Yeah. Unless. I get the whiskey. I, I got some weed or whiskey in me. Mm-hmm. Well, once they were convicted of arson, the twins were sent to stay at Broadmoor Hospital. Under the Mental Health Act of 1983, the twins were to be detained in the hospital for an indefinite amount of time. June felt this was an unjustly long sentence and that she and her sister had been unfairly targeted because of their refusal to speak. June told the New Yorker, Juvenile delinquents get two years in prison. We got 12 years of hell because we didn't speak. We lost hope, really. I wrote a letter to the queen asking her to let us out, but we were trapped. A letter to the queen. I know. I mean, imagine that you're so despondent and you think, well, we're going to die in here. They can literally keep us as long as they want. No one can say this. And this is a lockdown psychiatric facility. There were murderers, sex offenders. Yes, rapists. The worst of the worst are there. And then these two girls that just won't speak and no one is trying to get down to the root of why that is no at just 19 the girls were broadmoor's youngest ever inmates journalist marjorie wallace told npr that the twins were sent there because no other institution would accept them and that was because everyone who interviewed them found them too eerie too spooky wallace met the girls and worked with them during their incarceration she was surprised to find that their journals were filled with imaginative stories She told NPR the twins had been dismissed as being zombies, but had this rich imaginative life. So finally, someone's kind of coming into the picture that is seeing them for who they truly are. They said Marjorie said that once she read their diaries that she talked to them, you know, at first they're like, we're not going to talk to you. You're just another, you know, nobody that's going to just try to get information. But she said, you know, I read your diaries. And all of a sudden they said, did you think it was good? Was my story better? Which one did you like? What part did you like that they got super? Which is a very sister, normal yeah. teenage thing to do, uh-huh. which again, they ha- which is what they are at, the, at their core. Well, and she said, and also she said that they wanted to be heard. Mm-hmm. And by her actually taking the time, which they she said that the handwriting was super, super tiny. So she'd have to get you know, real close to the page to read it. But she said, I spent hours and hours reading this and go in and tell them, hey, I actually read your work. They were so happy to be seen, to be yeah. recognized that they just spilled everything to Marjorie. I mean, they became really close with her. Were the parents reading their diaries? I don't think they were because i know when marjorie went to go get them from the parents they were all of the diaries and books were still in the black trash bag that they had been when the police came to Mm -hmm. collect them when they got arrested yeah i don't think the parents were reading them hmm well the twins behavior inside the cells lived up to their bizarre reputation according to npr the twins would take turns eating or one would eat on one day and the other would trade off Another time, doctors walked in to find them standing frozen in the same pose, neither moving nor speaking. I always wondered, too, if this was either something Jennifer wanted or if it was a way for them to just amuse themselves because yeah. they're trapped and they're like, these people think we're weird. Let's give them a show. Maybe. June and Jennifer were placed on high doses of antipsychotic meds, which hindered their creative growth as writers and caused Jennifer to develop a neurological disorder that caused her to move and twitch involuntarily. Life for the twins was dark and going downhill fast. Wallace, who had access to their diaries, shared an entry with NPR News. June wrote of her sister, Nobody suffers the way I do. Not with a sister. With a husband, yes. With a wife, yes. With a child, yes. But this sister of mine, a dark shadow robbing me of sunlight, is my one and only torment. An entry from Jennifer read, We have become fatal enemies in each other's eyes. We feel the irritating, deadly rays come out of our bodies, stinging each other's skin. I say to myself, can I get rid of my own shadow? Impossible or not possible? Without my shadow, would I die? Without my shadow, would I gain life, be free, 
or left to die, without my shadow, which I identify with the face of misery, deception, and murder. Yeah, they said, the guards said that they would separate them because they would be fighting and just scratching and trying to tear each other's eyes out. And then they would be separated and they would just cry and weep because they weren't together. Then they'd put them back and it was, they would just fight. It was, they couldn't be together. They couldn't be apart. But they also were convinced that the other one was trying to kill them. Mm -hmm. Like June would, or Jennifer would say to June, did you poison my drink? Are you trying to kill me? Like they, they really became convinced that they each had it out for them, that they could see that killer instinct in the other one's eyes and that the only way they were going to be free is if one of them died. And I wonder too, if like it, it is because of being locked up. Cause before when they were with their parents, in theory, they could leave. Sure. But in this case, you are actually locked in a cell yeah. permanently with this person that you think they, I would kill her to get out of here. I bet she would do the same. Mm -hmm. Man. Yeah. Because it's hard because like you said, it's the one person that, you know, if we're, if you as Christy or me as Heather, as a human being, we're isolated and, you know, truly wholly feel alone. That's one thing. But when you have a twin, it's almost like a second, you know, a, a go to best friend permanent. And so you're, you're isolated down and forced to be dependent on this person. Mm -hmm. You're going to rebel against that. Yeah. It sounds like violently. You're rebelling against yourself in a way. In a way, too. And they were given meds and things did start to get a little better and they would talk more and they kind of evened out. So it also goes to show like there was a lot of mental health stuff going on there. And if they had been treated for this at a young age and been on medication or had therapy and stuff. I, it would have never gotten to this point, probably. I think so, yeah. They, there needed to be some early intervention. Yeah. But I think it was the, you know, like you said, the family was at the mercy of these doctors. Also, just the medical the science wasn't advanced enough yeah. to even know what was going on. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a again, where you see a strange case like this, it's kind of a mixture of a bunch of things all working together. Yep. The casserole. Mm-hmm. At 31 years old, the twins were living lives locked in prison, both physically and mentally. It seemed that they were unable to live apart from one another or together. That was when the two of them hatched their deadly plan. One twin would have to die so the other could live. Sadly, they had decided this was the only way for one of them to be free. They decided the death would come as they were released from the hospital. Eerily, that is almost exactly what happened. On the day of their release, a car was sent to pick up the girls. Once the car left the bounds of the facility, according to Marjorie Wallace... Jennifer slumped onto June's shoulder and fell into a coma. Only a few hours later, after being taken to a hospital, Jennifer was pronounced dead. Yeah, they said there was these huge wrought iron gates at the end of the drive leading away from the hospital. The gates open. The car goes through the gates. They turn around and look out the back window. And as the gates close, Jennifer slumps over. According to NPR News, an autopsy revealed swelling around Jennifer's heart. But the coroner who performed her autopsy found no sign of poison in her body. The journalist who knew them best, Marjorie Wallace, told NPR that she believed it was the result of Jennifer willing herself to die. June later said that her sister had been behaving strangely the day before she passed. She had been slurring her words and kept telling June that she was dying. Jennifer had reportedly also told her parole officer the day before being released from the hospital that things were about to get a lot better because she was about to die. So it really sounds like she willed herself to die. Can you do that? I don't know if you can do that. I wonder if she took something, but then they said they didn't find poison. The toxicology report came back clean and said it, there were no drugs or, or poison or anything in her body. There was no so signs of foul play. I do wonder if you could be almost like so depressed that you... Like rabbits. Do rabbits die when they're sad? Yeah. Oh, no. Rabbits can die of broken broken hearts. Oh, my God. If you have two rabbits that like, live together and love each other and then one dies, the other one will die usually pretty soon. You can't get in a replacement rabbit? Would you want a replacement best friend or spouse? No. I <laughs> would, mean, that, I guess... would that fill the void? Sometimes we can move on. I don't know how <laughs> the world works. Well, I guess rabbits are different. I had a, I, I knew a person that had a rabbit and... They went away. This is a really sad story. <laughs> they had to go out of town, so they left the rabbit with a friend mm -hmm. to to babysit. 
And the rabbit was so depressed that their owner was gone that it passed. It, it died of... So it's like yeah. dependent on humans. And I think they become very attached to other rabbits as well. What if you got three rabbits and one died? Would the other two both go or they're okay with each other? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. That's not an experiment I'd like anyone to do. <laughs> I don't I don't want to I don't want to know. But I I mean, I've never owned rabbits. I've just heard that this can they're happen so with them. Cute. They are very cute. In one final interview, June expressed to Marjorie Wallace the responsibility she felt in the wake of her sister's death. Wallace told NPR, She spoke very clearly about the conflict between her terrible grief at losing the person closest to her in her life and her freedom that Jennifer had given her, saying, Jennifer gave up her life for me, and now I have to go on and live for the both of us. After Jennifer was buried, June wrote a poem for her sister's tombstone that read, We once were two, we two made one, we no more two, through life be one, rest in peace. That's on her tombstone. Yeah, that's, you know, it's strange that, I mean, she feels this responsibility now that she, that Jennifer gave her life. Like she was reborn almost. Yeah, it's got to be a, a mixture of grief. And she said when her sister died, she was inconsolable, just mm -hmm. uh, weeping and screaming and, and grieving. At the same time, you feel a sense of relief. Like, I can finally be my own person. I'm not bound to this. I can find my own identity. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want. And you then know? you have guilt from that feeling. So it's just a whole roller coaster of emotions. It's a lot to deal with. June Gibbons is still alive. After losing her sister, she speaks in complete sentences and has no trouble communicating. She has, however, stopped writing books, saying, I don't see the point in writing books now. I can communicate by talking now, can I? And she does have an interesting way of speaking. Yes, it's a. Uh, if I, you watch the documentary, it's almost like she doesn't open her mouth when she talks. Yes, and, uh, and you know that may be a choice. It could be a speech impediment. It could be, you know, from being nervous, being on camera, or something, or in just years of not not speaking to other people, really. And I mean, you can. I could understand her watching. Yeah, you totally. It. You, you can totally understand, understand her. her, but you understand that if uh, I get that if you sped that up really fast and maybe threw in some you know because she's just you know speaking english and it's yeah. fine but threw in some like different kind of slang words that maybe you weren't familiar with in and, a different language and spoke it super fast i wouldn't know what she was saying yeah you know so uh, you you can kind of see where if they had gotten that speech therapy intervention you know early on but it's interesting how she kind of talks slightly with a little bit of disinterest about it just very matter of factly in the yeah. interview like this is what happened i was born a twin i'll die a twin i'll always be a twin she goes and visits her sister's grave every week mm -hmm. but she's just kind of like yeah that happened and she's like i can talk now so i don't you know what's the point of books yeah yeah it's wild so what do we think yeah, I think, you know, we kind of summed it up, you know, and they, they needed help early. Yeah, yeah. But with Jennifer's death, I don't know, that's... What do you, yeah, that's, how do you think that happened? Because the swelling on the heart, maybe she just stressed herself out so much that it caused some kind of heart condition. But she seemed to know it was coming. That's I true. mean, she She's told like, her sister and, and parole? her parole officer the day before she died. I will be dying tomorrow. Yeah. And immediately upon leaving... Just lays her head on her shoulder, her sister's shoulder, and goes. That's yeah. It goes into a coma. If we could all time our deaths, you just know, yeah, yeah. Oof. That's yeah. I wonder if a combination of of stress or just maybe you have a feeling. I don't know. I've never thought I was dying like so, been that close or yeah whatever. maybe you say some people do that where they say oh i think it's happening. you kind of feel it or something and if she was really in tune with herself or or maybe marjorie's right and she literally just willed herself to die to help free her sister That's which is the ultimate sacrifice true act of love yeah so it's a sad interesting story mm -hmm. and like you said very very rare yeah. In this, I, I in the articles I read, they reference like two other times where something kind of similar happened, where twins would develop their own language and and things like that. But they always intervene early enough to where they stopped it, and then they went on to live normal lives. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, that didn't happen here. And no, and they were sort of pushed into a life of torment and crime, and yeah, then I mean, horrible incarceration. Yeah, and then eventually death so one could be free man well let us know what you guys think 
if you're a twin and you have a language with your twin or Ooh, yeah. fun twin stuff. I had a friend whose mom was a twin. Oh, yeah. Identical. And they would often show up to the same thing, dress the same and not knew that they were going to do that. Like accidentally. Stuff. Yeah. I was just watching a doomsday prepper show. Okay. <laughs> and the guy's whole deal was he was thinking that nuclear plants were going to be attacked by terrorists. And so he had all this like plan to, you know, go to his bunker and everything. And his big deal was contingencies. And he's like, everything's got to be a contingency. I have one gun in my truck, but I have another one hidden. Oh, it's I like have... me and my chapstick. That's right. You always got to have a backup. <laughs> and so he has a daughter. He has a wife. His wife is a twin. He has hired the wife to be the nanny of their kid. And he says straight. Wait, he's hired his wife's twin. He's hired the wife's twin, his sister-in-law. Yeah, his sister-in-law to be the nanny, to be the nanny. And he like straight up looks into the camera and is like, I uh, did this because, you know, if anything were to happen to Carol, it'd be really great to have Christy around or whatever. And so he would just replace her. The implication was if the wife dies, that the daughter like wouldn't notice who, by the way, is like four years old. Like she would know that she used to have two of the same mom and now only has one. But the, it is like a strange implication. And they, the, the, you know, voiceover guys like, you know, Barry is so into t- redundancy plans that he has a wife and her sister. And I was like, is this kind of like, but it's not, they're not. I wonder cur- if he married a twin on, just for that. That's what I was like, on purpose. Wow. But it doesn't imply that they're in some type of like polyamorous situation. It's literally like he and his wife and then the sister is paid to be the nanny. But he does say in case, you know. So like, she could just slip in there and yeah. like his kids he wouldn't un- wouldn't notice I that guess that's not. not. He's like the now wow. the little, I think the daughter actually was named Heather. But they're like, little Heather would, you know, she would still have a mom. And I'm like, but also like that's her aunt. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine if the aunt wants to step in and help, but like, don't replace her. Don't try and tell the daughter, nothing's changed here. No, this is still, look, they look exactly the same. It's of course it's same. your mother. Yeah, it was very strange. That prepper show is fascinating. What is it? It's a doomsday prepper. It's a National Geographic show that's on Netflix. Oh, nice. But pretty. It's funny because every single family is prepping for something different. So one family is prepping for tornadoes. One family is prepping because they think that Greenland's going to melt and flood the United States. I don't think that's imminent. And Are they? in Greenland or the U.S.? This man is in like Arizona. <laughs> wow. He thinks it's going to flood. He goes, he's got, it's got a long way to go if it does. He goes, it's not getting to Arizona. Scientists tell you it'd be three to 500 years before it comes, but I think it's about two to three years. And I was like, you, sir, live in a mud hut <laughs> and you know better <laughs> than climate scientists. Also, Greenland is so far from Arizona. No, it's going to flood everything. It's going to take them out. <laughs> Wow. It's I'm so going to have to check this out because I am fascinated ridiculous. by doomsday preppers. Oh, man. Yeah. it's fa- They have like these like, well, I made, you know, 50 jars of pea soup and put it in a mason jar. And I'm like, if the, the apocalypse comes and all I have is 50 jars of lukewarm pea soup, I'll shoot myself. <laughs> there's no, I'm, there's no way. <laughs> pea soup. Is it's, that, does that have an infinite shelf life? She's like, this is real high in protein. That's so I was like, I don't know. I guess if you put it in a jar, it lasts forever. I don't know how jars work. Oh, man. I don't know. Get some Twinkies down there. Give me a pickles. Unlimited pickles. Those yeah. last forever. Yeah. Pickles, Twinkies, anything uh, with a ton of preservatives in it. Mm-hmm. Beef jerky. Oh, yeah. Jerky time. <laughs> the one guy in Arizona was making a, a smoke hut so he could make his own jerky using beer bottles. So he's been collecting beer bottles and he put... What's the, he prepping for? He's prepping Barbecue for, contest? For, well, he's prepping because he thinks Greenland's going to flood. Oh, this is the same guy? Yes. Yeah, so he thinks there's not going to be electricity. So he's going to have a, a smoke hut to smoke his meats. Is he single? No, uh, I think so. Mm, that's <laughs> surprising. <laughs> Jenny, get out in the mud. Go, come get out in this beef jerky hut. Oh, you just constantly smell like jerky. Yeah. Oh, that was just the thing. The mud hut's not done yet. It's take. He's like building it as the show uh, is there. Well, also, um, does he know that um, what makes mud is water? Yeah. Wow. And <laughs> if everything floods, his mud hut is just going to be dis- it's demolished. Should, it should be a, a mud pile. Why don't you make a a freaking brick hut or something that's not going to get torn away by water. I don't know how he has not learned from the three little pigs, but he hasn't. <laughs> he needs to read that story. <laughs> mud is the, is the, it sticks, then mud, then brick. I think so. He's, uh, he didn't get past that chapter. Greenland's the big bad wolf. That's right. He's the pig. <laughs> God. And the jerky inside the hut's also probably a pig. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, this poor guy. Well, anyway, highly recommend. I, I show. will be. I, you know what? I'm. I need a new show. I may go home and watch <laughs> this tonight. So I'm not kidding. I have another one for you, but it's disgusting. 
Okay. It's botched up bodies. Oh yeah. It's British. It's I probably won't watch that. Oh man. Like like plastic surgery. It's stuff? Plastic surgery gone wrong, but they're fixing it. That stuff still creeps me out. But you know how on TLC they'll be like, here's a vagina that's messed up because of surgery issues, but they'll blur it out. The British people don't give a f. <laughs> Nothing is here. Out. Is a fucked up badge. Yeah, for you it was, to see. But you feel bad for this lady because she tried to get cosmetic surgery, and of course, it goes wrong or whatever. And it is a so her badge was already messed up. No, she she thought I'm sure it was fine. She, she wanted to look nicer. She thought that her uh, she wanted to get a labia yeah reduction. smaller redu- yeah, yeah, yeah. basically cut them off yeah. And so then she got filler in the to well tr- that's gonna make him bigger well she was because she got the the initial surgery they totally cut him off too short took no instead oh, of a, God. she was out oh my i don't care my stomach just flipped Anyhow, thinking about that then they did the filler but then that kind of got messed up but then a new surgeon was able to remove the filler on camera no blur paris like almost vomited he's like you have, i can't take that he's stuff, like, i yeah. love you and i'll watch any show with you but i have to look away and i'm like well then you're not really watching it are you i love tommy but i won't watch any show with him tommy and i are gonna have to have a movie night where we watch tommy won't watch stuff. that he doesn't no? like that stuff no what does he watch that makes you not want to watch it uh I, there's i'm he doesn't watch anything that i grosses me out i'm just saying oh like internet stuff if i don't want to watch it like yeah. i'm not going to be like well, i guess i'll sit here and suffer no. through this he I'll was like, like you have to turn this off i'm going to be sick i'm going to go into the other room <laughs> no usually i watch shows that tommy has no interest in i watch shows and then tommy's playing video games in oh, okay. in, in the study so we're each doing our our own things yeah it. it's good you have and then you when you come back together you have stuff to talk about yeah, we don't though. <laughs> you don't have to. I mean, I do. I did tell him about Love Is Blind, okay, which I will be talking about on my next mix bag. I'm so excited because I don't watch reality shows, but one of my great joys in life is you explaining and telling me what happens in reality shows, and that's probably this one. Most of the reason I read I don't an article them. today that's kind of changed my opinion on on a hot take I had about it. Ooh! So I'm interested. I'm I'm excited to share that with you. Okay, I can't wait. Well, that's uh, the Silent Twins, you guys. Thank you so much for listening, as and, always. And thanks for suggesting it. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you have any other suggestions, email us is usually the easiest way. It's the best way to stay organized. Sometimes things get lost in the DMs. See, DMs are so hard to organize. It's just... Yeah, Instagram doesn't organize those well. It's, and I can't go back and research them. You can only search by username. So if you have a topic suggestion, email it to sinisterhoodpodcast yep. at gmail.com. Please. We love... Your suggestions. We wouldn't have known about this had it not been for Mm -hmm. that. Much appreciated. Well, we have a live show coming up. We are performing with our improv troupe, The Cult, at Dallas Comedy Festival on March 27th at 9 p.m. We're also doing a show, a live podcast recording of Sinisterhood, March 28th at 6 p.m., but that one is sold out. So if you weren't able to get tickets to the Sinisterhood live show, you can still hang out with us that weekend. Just grab tickets to The Cult by going to Sinisterhood.com forward slash links, and there's a link right there to check out our live show. Sinisterhood will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to our Patreon to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You'll get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout-out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini-sode. You also get access to our weekly mixed bag content where we bring three things to share with the other person and just talk about it. It could be a book, TV show, movie, or even a delicious snack. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-outs. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. And if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I'm on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I am on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Kristen Nirad. Becca D. Anna Milner. Lauren Jordan. Whitney Davis. Megan Hall. Max Schaefer. Tiffany Ross. Alyssa Joy 
Nuremberger, Jessica, Monique Lopez, Whitney Blair, Danielle M. Myers Esquire, Lisa Davies, Stacey Becker, Sarah Haywood, Amy Collins. Thank you so much, guys. We could not do this without you. We appreciate you so, so much. Keep it creepy. Sinister Hood.